Hello and welcome everyone to this week's uh, Inspiring Science Education Hangout. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I'll be your host this week and uh, hopefully every other week for a long time to come. Although I will warn you, we are going to go on a summer hiatus and take off June, July, and August. And we hope all of you get to enjoy your summers as much as we do. But summer's not here yet. And uh, so instead, uh, today I'm going to be talking to you along with a special guest um, all about the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, when people hear terms like radiation, uh, they often get nervous that this might be something that could kill them. And while there are very deadly forms of radiation, when a scientist uses the word radiation, most of the time all we're referring to is light and the occasional high energy particle. Um, this radiation comes in many different energies, many different colors. Colors and energy are actually uh, different words to describe very much the same thing. And to try and help you understand um, all of these different words and how they all fit together in astronomy. I have with me uh, Mark uh, McLaren, who's coming to us from the Netherlands. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Pamela, how are you? Oh, I can't hear you. Are you? Am I muted? Am I online now? You're not showing as muted. You have now muted, unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me now? I think this problem may be on my end. Hold on one second. Let me switch where my audio is coming from. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you say something again? Yeah, sure. Okay, now, yes, you're just fine. Sorry, that was a problem on my end. Hopefully we won't get too much echo. Um, so, so welcome, Mark. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do up there in the Netherlands? Yeah, I'm here. This is the European Space Agency's big technical center just south of Amsterdam. And I'm the senior science advisor for the European Space Agency for the science program and for robotic exploration. So that's all of the missions which we fly in the solar system, whether it's visiting the planets, uh, looking at the sun, or astrophysics missions looking out to the universe beyond. So I, I advise on those missions, but I also have the job of communicating about those missions to the scientific community, and as we're doing today, out to educators and to the general public. And, and when you use the word robot, you're not restricting yourself to the walking or running um, limbed critters that we're used to seeing coming out of labs here on Earth. Uh, robots in space actually means something kind of different, and it's not just curiosity that counts as a robot. Can, can you describe some of the diversity of things that, that you deal with that are termed robots? In some ways, everything we put into space is a robot of some kind. They may not have arms, they may not have legs, but they will have eyes. They might have noses, you know, they can see things, they might be able to smell things. Uh, we can sample gases, for example, when we get close to close to a comet with our Rosetta mission, for example. So there are many senses beyond uh, just the, the walking, the, the ambulatory stuff. But we also are the robotic exploration part of our program specifically actually refers to going to the surface of Mars uh, and driving a rover on the surface of Mars in, starting in 2018. It's what we call our ExoMars program. But everything's a robot. We're, if we're not there, we've put our intelligence in a box and we've sent it somewhere, it's a robot. That That is a pretty cool way to, to look at things. Now, some of the things that we put in space have simpler jobs than others. Um, we have lots of telescopes that basically happily orbit uh, surveying the sky night after night or taking directed images for scientists. Now, we put these these spacecraft, well, they're spacecrafts. So we put them in space because they're spacecraft, but there are reasons that we build spacecraft rather than putting telescopes on tops of mountains. Can you help our audience understand why we need telescopes in space? Well, if we start from the, the human eye, um, the Earth and its atmosphere above us, actually the atmosphere is transparent to the light which comes in in quite a narrow range of wavelengths. Uh, in fact, it's opaque to many of the wavelengths in space which we're interested in. 
it's no, it's not an amazing fact. It's obviously not a coincidence at all that the human eye has evolved to see in a wavelength where the light, the, the atmosphere is transparent. The sun gets through from the sun and we can, the light gets through from the sun and we can then see at that wavelength. It also corresponds to more or less the peak energy of the sun. So this is a, an efficient place to be working. But either side of the visible part of the spectrum, you know, the classical rainbow from uh, uh, indigo and violet at one end all the way to red at the other, we have ultraviolet and infrared, and much of that light just doesn't get through. Um, but that doesn't mean that light isn't out there in space. So if we really want to explore the universe in its great diversity, we have to get above the atmosphere and open our eyes to those other wavelengths, if you like. So in, in a sense, it's as if we're in a darkened room and we couldn't see anything at all. If you opened the door and you could suddenly see outside, opening that is what we do by going into space. That's, that's at least one of the things. Uh, one of the other things, of course, is that the Earth's atmosphere is not only opaque at some wavelengths, it, it shimmies, it moves around, it, it, uh, it, it adds on some uh, extra turbulence. So it makes our, our images somewhat blurry. And I, like I don't thunder. think I've... I don't think I've heard someone use the word shimmies before. Well, you know, yeah, it, it, you, you, you can dance for me and I'll keep talking. And uh, so, yeah, it, just that turbulence. I mean, everybody knows it when they look close to the horizon. You can see there's kind of waving of the atmosphere. And we see that when we look straight up as well. And it blurs our images out. We have ways of correcting for that now on some big telescopes. But if you put a telescope above the atmosphere, um, you immediately get rid of that. And a, and a telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, although it's relatively modest by modern standards in terms of its aperture, just two and a half meters across, it still delivers some of the very sharpest images that you can get in visible wavelengths, even compared to big telescopes on the ground. And, and one of the things a lot of people haven't realized yet is the Very Large Telescope Array uh, it's a set of four telescopes that are huge and a series of smaller interconnected telescopes. Uh, the Very Large Telescope uh, down in Chile is capable of getting higher resolutions than Hubble, uh, and it has significantly larger surface area than Hubble. But what you have to go through in order to get that higher resolution actually precludes certain types of science from being done. So all of these different strides that we've we've figured out how to make in order to get these super high resolutions from the surface of the planet, I still don't get us all the way to where you can get with one school bus size telescope. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's changed perhaps in the last few years is the, the synergy between ground-based and space-based telescopes. They all have their pros and cons. Uh, phrase we, we mentioned earlier on, horses for courses. You know, you, we, we pick a telescope to do a certain job um, and there is no one telescope that, that can do everything. So in fact, the synergy between ground-based telescopes and space-based is very strong. People would say, if you're building a 40 meter telescope on the ground, why do you need to build a space telescope at the same time or vice versa? And it turns out, not a, even at one wavelength, even in the visible or the infrared, we, we, we need those different capabilities on the ground and in space to do different parts of the science problem. But as soon as you get to the wavelengths which can't be seen from the ground, that's it. You're in space or you're nowhere. So the high energy and the far infrared places, which just the atmosphere is opaque, that's it. We have to go into space. So I'm pulling up a, an image that will hopefully help people uh, get a sense of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here we have the, the entire spectrum mapped out, and this is actually a logarithmic scale. So each of those big ticks means you've increased or de decreased by an entire factor of 10. Um, and looking at this, this is the set of wavelengths that generally get observed by uh, our whole myriad of different astronomy telescopes. And you can see in the center of this that uh, that is indeed a very small fraction of the entire spectrum that is getting used for visible light. But if you look at these little tiny galaxy pictures, um, and I'll zoom in so that you can see those better. Um, so starting in the visible, what we have is there's Andromeda, and this is how we're used to seeing Andromeda. 
But uh, as we go towards the infrared, we see that different parts of the galaxy are now lighting up that weren't lighting up in the visible. Um, if I wanted to observe the infrared from space, what different things would I see and what different telescopes would I use? Well, if you think about the visible spectrum, typically people will associate the blue colors at one end with something that's hot and the red colors at the other end with something that's cooler. And that's broadly the case. So when we move down to the infrared and beyond, we're looking at cooler and cooler temperatures. And so when we look at a galaxy like Andromeda in the far infrared, we see gas and dust at temperatures of maybe minus 200 degrees centigrade, maybe minus 230 centigrade. And that material could well be the, the gas and dust which is just heating up slowly now on its way to forming new stars and new planets. We in the visible end of the spectrum, we see them when they're made, the stars, but when we want to see them being born, we want to witness star formation, we typically need to go into the infrared. There's a slight subtlety here as well, which is that everybody sitting around watching this now, uh, you and I, we're all glowing in the infrared as well. Uh, we see ourselves reflecting visible light, but we're also glowing in the infrared because we're, we're at room temperature and we give off that, that heat emission. If you build a telescope on the ground to detect infrared light that's also giving off infrared light, the telescope's warm, then you blind yourself completely. It's like using a visible light telescope made out of fluorescent light strips, for example. I mean, that's not a good telescope. So I'll be going into space um, and using the other quality of space, we can then cool it down. We can get the telescope extremely cold. So for example, the James Webb Space Telescope, when it gets launched in 2018, will be a million and a half kilometers away from the Earth, behind a giant sun shield, will be able to drop its temperature to minus 220 degrees centigrade or so. It then stops glowing. And that means then we can see things deep in space, which are glowing at those low temperatures. And, and this is actually very important to the longevity of the mission. Uh, other spacecraft like Spitzer uh, have, have suffered somewhat uh, because to do their truly uh, long wave well, long wavelength observations, they needed to have coolant on board. Even Hubble at one point had coolant on board to help cool all of those instruments down to um, eliminate a lot of the, well, noise created by the instrument actually being heated up. Um, we can't get rid of all of the heat because the spacecraft itself is generating heat with all of its electronics, but the sun shield does get a long way towards getting things cold enough. Yeah, um, I mean, there's always going to be missions. Uh, our Herschel mission was, you know, similar, bigger than, uh, relative to Spitz of, at the very longest wavelengths. Uh, you really need to cool at least the detector. Even if you don't cool the telescope itself anymore, the detector needs to be cold enough that it doesn't see itself. And the Planck mission, which measured the cosmic microwave background, the glow from the Big Bang, which is still left out there, there's no way we could have cooled that completely passively just with ra uh, with a, um, a sun shield or radiators. You still need, in many cases, some of these liquid uh, cryogens, liquid superfluid helium. Maybe you can use a cryo cooler as we're using on, uh, uh, on JWST. But uh, again, we pick the technologies to suit the science that we're really trying to do there. So, so you bring up uh, Planck, which is working in the microwave. Mm -hmm. um, and some parts of the microwave we do do here from the surface of the planet. Um, yeah. Haystack Observatory, where I worked in high school, is one of those places. And there's several others scattered about the planet that work together to make high resolution observations. Uh, but many of these things you have to do from on orbit. Now, as we get into the microwave, you, you already mentioned we see the cosmic microwave background radiation. What else do we start to see as we go into the microwave? Well, one of the big problems actually, if you want to see the cosmic microwave background is you actually have to strip away the entire Milky Way, which sits in the foreground. Uh, you have to, there's, there's uh, glowing dust at the very the highest energies of, of Planck. They're very, very cold dust in our galaxy, but at the, the high end of Planck, there's that. At the other end, there's radio emission from things like uh, spinning dust particles and material moving, magnetic fields and electrons moving around and giving us emission at the longest radio frequencies. And that just blinds us completely. So that had to be 
extremely precisely mapped frequency by frequency to build up a perfect picture of the Milky Way that you could then remove and behind that at a tiny, tiny fraction of that signal and see the cosmic microwave background. And that's very hard. It's, it's effectively impossible to do from the ground because no, no system is stable enough over the long period of time needed to scan the whole sky, which was Planck's goal. You can do little pieces from the ground but very well, but if you want to do the whole sky, you need a telescope in space with extremely precise, repeatable measurements. And, and beyond just uh, looking at the cosmic microwave background and removing all of that foreground noise, there are people that consider that foreground noise science. Absolutely right, yes. <laughs> um, one, one person's dirt is another person's gold, absolutely. Exactly. So, so as we get into the microwave radiation, we're now peering deep into the hearts of dust clouds. We're now starting to see the beginning glow of young stars that haven't yet started their nuclear reactions. Um, now, beyond microwave, we can start to get into the radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radio isn't so much someplace that we're exploring from space yet, but uh, it's, it's worth at least mentioning um, where radio fits into this picture. You know, radio can be very important in terms of looking at a, a number of physical phenomena. We typically associate light with heat, but light can also come, as I said before, from electrons being accelerated around in magnetic fields. Um, and we see very, very different phenomena there out in space. Um, it's also the case that, you know, when we get out to the radio regime, it, it, even on the ground, it doesn't make, it's not a transparency issue whether you're on the ground or in space, but one thing we're very good at on this planet is polluting our environment with radio signals. Um, and so having telescopes in radio quiet places where there's no background signal from us on our mobile phones, um, you know, that can be tricky. And so one reason you might want to go into space for the radio ultimately is to put an observatory on the dark side of the moon so that you're shielded completely from the signals that we're putting out there. I mean, that's still out there. We're not doing it yet, but uh, then you would get down to much, much quieter levels uh, and see fainter signals. Now, now I actually have to call you on that one because you uh -huh. called it the dark side of the moon. Yeah, sorry, yes. As, as soon as I said it, I knew that somebody... <laughs> yeah. the, invis the, the other side of the moon that we never see. Let's, the, let's... the far side. It's... Oh, it's it gets just as much sunlight as the side that we get That's to see. So sadly, it's not an answer to all of our optical astronomy needs, but oh, no, it's no. a great and answer for radio. That's definitely the case, yeah. Although there have been plans, as you know, to put uh, very large telescopes on the moon, even in the optical, uh, made out of, would you believe it, mirrors made out of spinning mercury, rather than actually flying a giant mirror there. Just take a tub of mercury, spin it around, it assumes the shape of a mirror, and you could, in principle, build a very big telescope there. It would get covered in moon dust pretty quickly, but... Uh... And, uh, yeah, so th there is precedence for doing this. The Canadians, uh, not all of the Canadians, but there have been select Canadian scientists uh, working, I believe, on the West Coast uh, who built a telescope out of Mercury, um, but Mercury, as uh, the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland implies, um, Mercury does tend to cause mental uh, issues if you're exposed to it too much. And we like our astronomers, so we try not to build too many things yeah. on a Mercury on the planet where we'll be breathing the gases. I was wondering um, what you were saying about Canadians there for a moment, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, my husband's Canadian. I do like them. <laughs> um, but uh, so beyond beyond that, we, we have... Um, the entire other side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So far we've gone toward the red. And one interesting thing this brings up is we've been talking about the longer and longer, the redder and redder wavelengths as being the cold ones. But every little child is taught, you use the red <laughs> crayon for the hot things and the blue yeah. crayon for the cold things. Yeah. And, and it's actually exactly the opposite. So here we are at the, reddest side of the electromagnetic spectrum where we're seeing basically cold gas uh, very quietly uh, with very few collisions. There's no sound in space. So when I say quiet, I mean very few collisions going on. Um, 
giving off the occasional spin flip radiation. Um, this is where a, a atom simply um, moves from one energy state to another and gives off a little bit of electromagnetic radiation in the radio. We have the microwave where we're starting to see stars beginning to form. We move into the infrared where now everything's lit up a whole lot more. Um, visible, we're now seeing stars and the gas clouds reflecting the starlight, uh, sometimes emitting it as it passes through. And this starts to bring us out to the ultraviolet. Can you tell us a little bit about the ultraviolet? Well, uh, as you said, you know, the blue is often the color on a tap which says cold water, but for us astronomers, blue means hot. It means uh, high temperature. If you were to look out in space and look at uh, with your telescope, you would be able to see stars which are red and some which are blue. And there'll be some which are so blue effectively that there's, the bulk of their light is being emitted at even shorter wavelengths than we can see. Um, and that's, some of that can be pure temperature effect. They're just extremely hot, 20, 30,000 degrees centigrade. Um, and that is giving the bulk of its light out then in the ultraviolet beyond what we can see. So part of that is just looking at very hot objects. Um, and the way that the objects get hot can be different. It can be from being a hot star heated up from underneath, a lot of nuclear fusion, a lot of power, big hot star. But also we can heat material up by throwing it into a place where there's a lot of gravity. Uh, and as that an object falls into a gravity well, maybe around a black hole or around some other compact object, that material speeds up to such high uh, velocities that when it maybe hits something, there's a, there's a lot of temperature involved. The kinetic energy gets turned into temperature. And again, it gives off um, a lot of emission at high energies. So typically, we look at the very high energies uh, to try to look in, in extreme environments, places where uh, gravity becomes a very important thing. Um, and you can get to effective temperatures of, of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of degrees. And then there are other peculiar ways of getting to millions of degrees, which in very rarefied gas, so not a very compact region full of you know, material bashing together, but our sun has an atmosphere around it, which actually has millions of degrees around it, even though it's not the surface is cooler than a few thousand. Above that, you can get to millions. And then that gives off X-ray radiation, uh, even gamma ray radiation. And, and with, with our sun, uh, this high temperature uh, gas, as, as you said, it's very diffuse gas. There's not that many uh, particles per whatever unit volume you want to look at. And we think that this energy probably is released through the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And as we continue moving through the electromagnetic spectrum, um, as, as you said, we, we go from the ultraviolet, and as we keep going out, we start to get into the X-rays and gamma rays. And as, as scientists, we're not quite yet to the stage of having pretty pictures in gamma ray. Um, taking pictures with gamma rays is hard. They would much rather pass through your telescope than be imaged by your telescope. So. Um, gamma rays, we, we actually usually count the number of photons instead of trying to make pictures with the photons. Yep. Um, so, so what are we starting to see as we get out here into the land of, of X-rays and gamma rays in, in the shortest wavelengths that we're currently observing? Well, again, one of the areas which is really big for high energy astrophysics is this, this issue of looking at black holes and looking at what's going on in uh, the so-called accretion disk as material. Everybody thinks, you know, material falls into a black hole, it's gone. Uh, the hole is black. This is true. But surrounding that, as the material falls in, it gets extremely hot. And just before it disappears into the black hole, there's a huge amount of energy given off at very, very high energies there. Um, very short wavelength. So we're seeing it in x-rays particularly. And then so we have events. Sorry, go on. So, so what, what's happening here is we have all of this dust and gas that through various processes has gotten pulled into a disk around the black hole. And this is as true for stellar mass black holes as it is for the supermassive monsters in the hearts of, of galaxies. 
um, the black holes aren't like actively going out and sucking dust in. This is material that while it was on its merry journey through the universe, um, went of its own accord too close to a black hole and ended up in this, this disc. And the disc is so hot and so dense that it can actually have the same physical states that you might find deep inside of a star. So you can actually find nuclear reactions going on inside some of these discs in, in supermassive black hole cases. And in the case of the disks around stars, they just sometimes explode, and we call these uh, cataclysmic variables. Yep, and and you know, expanding on that theme, we you know, of course, we we have objects like gamma ray bursters at the very highest energies. We have colossal, immense explosions in space, which uh, put out huge amounts of energy. We see them in the visible as well, but they, they, their characteristic is they they're so energetic they put uh, energy out. Uh, photons, you know, high energy uh, bullets flying through space at us at the, you know, in the gamma rays. And we see that because, you know, gamma rays are not that common in space. We don't see them from, you know, run of the mill objects to, to be a gamma ray emitter. You have to be pretty special. Um, and when we see these colossal explosions going off and initially people thought these were actually uh, back in the sixties, people thought these might've been nuclear tests setting off nuclear bombs on the earth and yeah. so the, the satellites which first discovered them were actually looking down looking to see if anybody was letting bombs off uh, testing them and then later on people thought well the colossal it's coming from space but the colossal energy involved that you know they can't be that far away from us right they must be local to us to for us to receive that much energy it was it was found no they're they're all over the sky they're not distributed just in the plane of our milky way these objects are typically very distant from us and, and absolute monsters in terms of their explosive power. And and it took us tens of years to figure that out because it is so hard to observe in the gamma rays. And the initial thought was since these th seem to be distributed all over the sky in a random distribution, they either had to be close enough that they were literally local and we yeah. weren't being affected by the fact that there's a disk of stars around us because if if it was part of our, our galaxy and not super nearby we would have expected to see that disk-like distribution but then we eventually started getting spectra of the optical components the optical yeah. afterglow of some of these um they're they're amazing now yeah. If, if I wanted to observe the universe in these different colors, I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet and not spreadsheet, pull up my graphic. And if you can talk me through what spacecraft I would turn to in your arsenal of, of, of telescopes, um, I think that would be a great way to start to wind this down. And then uh, after we, we review the telescopes, um, I'd love to hear what your favorite part of the spectrum is. So if you can think about that. Uh, while we go down the list. So sure. we left off in the gamma rays and x-rays. So where, where would I turn in orbit to see these? Well, we have two, two big observatories, uh, which have been in operation quite a number of years now at the very far uh, extremes on the right hand side, the gamma rays, we have a mission called Integral. Uh, Integral is an observatory which is looking at a, a whole slew of different uh, phenomena in the universe at the very high end. It overlaps slightly in the X-rays with our other big observatory on this side of the spectrum called XMM Newton. It's a big X-ray observatory. It's similar with complementary capabilities to NASA's Chandra, which was launched the same time. Um, and, and in fact, we're going to be going back into this piece of the spectrum with our, one of our next big observatories called Athena which will be flying in the mid 2020s or so. So again, a big general purpose observatory there. So this piece of the spectrum um, is has been fairly well covered for a long time because you can't do this from the ground. If you're gonna do it from anywhere, you do it from space. Um, and uh, so we're, we're very sure we'll continue in this area. We're gonna build a big mission in there. Um, and I'm sure NASA will uh, participate in that mission or, or go with future missions in the high energy domain as well. Uh, and then if you move over further, one of the interesting things is that the ultraviolet actually is a little bit less covered these days. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, which we're partners with NASA, um, does have uh, good capability there, but it's it's going to finish soon. And, and 
this is a piece of the spectrum which is not tremendously well covered. Partly because the science cases that people want to pursue are actually driven by other wavelength domains. That's not to say there's no science here at all, but uh, to make huge steps, you need a very much bigger telescope than we've had in the past, and that's going to be very expensive to build. So uh, that piece of the domain uh, is, is at the moment more or less for us covered by the participation in Hubble. And if you come down to the visible, um, of course, Hubble's there and Hubble celebrates its 25th anniversary this week, uh, which has been a, an enormous resource for everybody. But we have a mission in there which is doing something very different now. We have a mission called Gaia. Now, people are used to Hubble. It takes pictures and, and, and spectra and does science across the whole uh, gamut of possible uh, interests. Gaia is doing something very specific. It's in the visible, but it's it's not only doing, it's doing more or less one thing, let's say. It's measuring the positions of the stars extremely precisely. One billion stars in our Milky Way, and it's measuring those to astonishing accuracies. It's able to measure the position of a star to the, the equivalent of the width of a human hair as seen from 2,000 kilometers. So this is an extraordinarily precise thing. And you think, well, so what? Why am I doing that? Well, if you keep doing that, if you measure the positions of stars repeatedly over five years, you can measure their distances and you can measure their motions in the Milky Way. And over time, you can build up a, a, effectively a catalog which includes the movements of a billion stars, 1% of all the stars in our Milky Way. And we can make a, a movie of the Milky Way, run it forwards, what's going to happen to it in the future, but we can run it backwards and see how the Milky Way was put together. So that's in a way, a bit of a departure because we're now doing very specialized bits of science where before we had perhaps big observatories doing general science, we're now beginning to target what we're doing there. And then we come into the infrared, uh, the near infrared. Uh, we've, there have been several missions there, um, but the one that's coming next in uh, for us, we have a mission called Euclid. And Euclid is designed to look at galaxies across the... Uh, the whole of the sky or a large fraction of the sky and is going to be using these as probes of dark energy and dark matter. Uh, we're not interested as such in the galaxies, but what they can tell us about the stuff that's unseen. Uh, before that, in 2018, we'll be launching with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is actually a very big general purpose observatory, if you like, successor to, to Hubble, but much bigger and working in the infrared. Um, and that's going to be an amazing machine. And uh, I'll give you a clue to the answer to your question. I've been involved in that mission for a long time. So uh, it's perhaps no surprise where my favorite piece of the <laughs> electromagnetic spectrum might be. Um, and then as we move out to the longer wavelengths, actually, uh, we talked briefly about both uh, Herschel, our Herschel Space Observatory, a three and a half meter telescope, the biggest astronomical telescope ever put into space to date. Uh, that worked for four years. Um, and very successfully, but as you talked about earlier on, it had to, to cool down, it used uh, cryogens, it used liquid helium, and it ran out. Uh, it was perfectly predicted, it was going to happen. Very successful, a huge amount of science still to be done from the, the, the data that's in the archives, but it's no longer operating. And the same is true at the even longer wavelengths than uh, the, the microwave into the short, into the radio, the Planck mission. Planck was launched on the same rocket as Herschel in 2009. Planck also completed its work um, uh, a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, um, but people are still analyzing all of the data uh, to look at the cosmic microwave background. And as you said before, all of the other stuff you had to strip away. There's plenty of science on the way to the CMB. So actually, this, this piece of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum from our side, it, it, in a sense, is not well covered at the moment. Um, and there are people are very interested in building new missions in the far infrared and perhaps the short end, end of the radio. So we'll see what comes along. Um, we're, we're routinely selecting new missions. Um, but that area, I think, is, is something as we digest the results from Herschel and Planck, people will be coming back saying, yeah, you know, you know what? We need to go in here with a targeted new mission uh, to go and uh, start looking at new phenomena. And, and lest I forget, the other, of course, one of the big other topics for people of interest is exoplanets, looking for planets around other stars. And we have a mission called PLATO, which will be doing a very, very specific thing. It won't be taking pictures to download to the Earth. It'll be operating in the visible, but it'll be watching stars like the Kepler mission 
uh, and looking for very tiny changes in the brightness as a planet moves across in front of the star. Um, and those will be focusing on nearby stars so that we can find potentially planets in the habitable zone around stars near to us. And, and for any of you out there uh, watching who'd like to learn more about these individual missions, uh, the Astronomy Cast podcast, which I co-host with Fraser Kane, uh, we've done several recent missions, uh, especially on the planet finders. Uh, so Gaia, which will be able to detect yeah. some planets. We, we did an entire episode, and I have to admit, the engineering on that mission uh, impresses me more than the engineering on pretty much anything else out there. Um, now, Gaia isn't your favorite, so what is your favorite? <laughs> I'm not allowed to have favorites, of course. Uh, oh, that's true. Well, I, you know, they're all my favorites. Every child is, uh, is, is my favorite. <laughs> um, but my background actually is in the infrared. It's where I come from uh, scientifically because when I was a student too many years ago, uh, I was involved in building ground-based instrumentation uh, for a big telescope in Hawaii, the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope. We built one of the first ever infrared cameras uh, at that point. Prior to that, we were mapping the sky with a single pixel, which was extremely boring and laborious. But since then, we've now uh, got to the place where we have cameras with millions of pixels, and we're taking really fat, spectacular data. And JWST follows on from that. And the scientific motivation, you mentioned it before, is to look into these dark places which are cold, shrouded in dust and see stars being born inside those dark clouds. And that's those are my interests, uh, trying to find young stars, young planets, um, not so far away within the Milky Way and uh, see if we can understand how these things are put together. It's, it's going to be an amazing future once we get that giant telescope uh, placed where the sun doesn't shine beyond the moon. So to speak, yes. <laughs> Um, so thank you. This has been a, a delightful tour de force of the electromagnetic spectrum. Do you have any parting words you want to leave our audience with? No, uh, you know, it's great to be able to talk to you about this. I mean, and, and of course, we can only skim over all of the amazing things that every one of these missions do. Uh, I think the critical thing is always from our perspective, we are a space agency and we, you know, we talk about the space missions. But it's what I said right at the beginning. For astronomers, it's very important to have a kind of a, a multi-messenger, multi-wavelength view because the same object can emit light in many different frequencies, very different wavelengths. And sometimes we want to see one end or the other. We want to see very high resolution detail. Maybe we want to measure the spectrum for one object, and we can do that from the ground. But the most precise, beautiful picture to get the, the tiny details, maybe we need to do that from space. So. There's no real competition between space and ground. We we need we need it all. I'm afraid. Uh, it's it's a collaboration. We will always need Earthers and spacers. Absolutely right. Thank you so much, Mark. This this has been a real pleasure, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you very much, Pamela. And uh, for those of you still here, um, thank you. Not still here. For those of you, I see the numbers increasing as we talk, so that's kind of cool. Um, for, for those of you uh, who, unlike Mark, aren't going to disappear, I'm now going to uh, overview the lesson plans that we've developed that, uh, if you're an educator, you can use in your classroom to help discuss the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, throughout this Hangout, I, I've been showing you a, a poster that uh, will be uploaded to the Inspiring Science Education uh, community that we have associated with this particular hangout. And this poster is, is something that um, you can download and print out on a poster printer. Um, or if you happen uh, to not mind paying postage, I can actually ship you a copy of this um, in a return tube or a we can figure things out. Email me and we can get you this poster. We have a bunch of them here at Southern Illinois. And this poster was designed to help you and your students understand um, how the universe varies from color to color using a familiar object. And the entirety of this lesson is actually centered on this idea of the familiar becomes unfamiliar as we move through the electromagnetic spectrum. As a founding activity to get your lesson started, 
Uh, we encourage you to go to the Chromoscope website. It's chromoscope.net. And, and this is a website that's been designed to allow you to literally scan through our galaxy in a variety of different colors. So this is what the website looks like. And as I use it, I can go out to the gamma ray and see what the galaxy looks like in the gamma ray, the X-ray, visible, hydrogen alpha, which is um, a specific transition line in the red. So everything in this gas that we're seeing, um, this is light generated by electrons that are jumping from the third energy level in hydrogen to the second energy level in hydrogen. We have near infrared, far infrared, microwave, and radio. Um, you can zoom in with this. Um, of course, zoom out um, and scan around so that you can see all the different pieces. This is just a starting point to get your students oriented on how the different colors look. Uh, you can use this to begin a dialogue about how what we see with our eyes is, is really only the smallest fraction of all the light that's out there in the universe. Once you've introduced them to the concept of color, of colors that are beyond what we can see with the visible, the next thing that we're gonna have your students do is actually work to create their own versions of, of that poster I'd been showing you. Uh, the activity when it's posted on the Inspiring Science Education uh, website, uh, which at the time that we're recording this is undergoing upgrades. Um, once it's posted up there, we will have a template that your students can use to drop in their own pictures. So instead of seeing what Andromeda looks like at a variety of different wavelengths, you can, for instance, encourage um, your students to spread out across the Messier catalog with different students selecting different objects from throughout our galaxy and the universe beyond. Once they've all selected objects, there's a really good website that you can go to and get data from all the different um, spacecraft that have publicly accessible databases. This is a NASA funded site that um, allows you to get um, images from spacecraft that aren't just US spacecraft, but also European spacecraft. And while there is a non-astronomers page, we actually want you for this activity to go in through the normal Skyview query form. And when you first click on this, you can suddenly see there are a ton of different options. And you can have the kids explore what did the different spacecraft. So here you can see there's Fermi and Egret. Uh, there's it, um, the Digital Sky Survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, Galax, Rosat. All the different spacecraft are listed here. Some of the best images are uh, down here in this goods field. And if you scan through this, you'll see it's actually a variety of different spacecraft ranging from Europe's Herschel to the US Spitzer to the very large telescope uh, down in uh, Chile, which is a European Space Agency, or sorry, a European Southern Observatory project. Um, all of these different really high quality images span all across the electromagnetic spectrum are and are there for you to select and download. Um, your students can simply type in the name of an object. So for instance, uh, the Orion Nebula, or let's do M42, because that's less typing. I can type in M42 and for starts, let's just look and see what does that look like in the ultraviolet. I'm gonna look at this with a large two degree field and I like pixels, so I'm going to put in a thousand pixels and submit my request. And what it's doing right now is it's reaching out to the Galax database and 
it's pulling up an image. And the first thing that your kids might learn is, well, everything hasn't been observed by all the space telescopes. So it turns out that as I record this live, I picked an object that isn't in that particular field. But I do know, because I pulled it up earlier, that Andromeda is in the Galax field. So here's Andromeda as viewed by Galax. So this is what the Andromeda galaxy looks like in the ultraviolet. Now, I also pulled it up in Fermi, and suddenly I can see, wow, gamma ray space telescopes, they don't have particularly good resolution. This doesn't look like a galaxy anymore. And in fact, what I'm seeing is the random gamma ray particles coming off where there happen to be high energy events, either in the foreground, in the Andromeda galaxy, or perhaps even in the background. The ultraviolet I'm left with is beautiful filigree of stars and gas. This is all the slightly dangerous color of light that can burn your skin. Luckily, our atmosphere blocks most of it, which is why we have to launch spacecraft. We also have optical surveys. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and you can actually see the pattern of the survey across the sky, um, seeing where they took the most data here in this beautifully filled out section, and seeing where the data wasn't quite as good in some of the places around it. Um, here's a different color of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and I can see again here, wow, you, Kurt, didn't get this in the infrared. So there are holes in our data, and this is why we have to keep looking. We haven't looked at everything yet. WISE, however, has looked at this in the micron radiation. Um, and here again, I can see as we go into the microwave, the resolution isn't the same. Things don't look the same. And again, I hit a blank when I hit the Chandra X-ray data. So there's lots of different data out there that your students can probe and um, it will allow them to start to see